Hi friends, welcome to the NPTEL course Strategy and Technology, a practical primer. We are in week 7 with the theme of Dynamic Strategy Equilibrium. In this lecture, the 32nd in the series, we will discuss the very important topics of integration, expansion and diversification. These are strategic initiatives that are taken from time to time by companies trying to grow their businesses. Vertical integration is the combination of technologically distinct design, production, distribution, selling and other economic processes within the confines of a single form. Such processes are usually a part of a total value chain. If we look at a product, the assembly of the product is the simplest because the discrete components can be brought together onto an assembly line and the product finished. A firm specializing in only assembly can integrate itself into manufacture of some or all components. Similarly, a firm manufacturing components and assembling them into a product may integrate itself into manufacture of materials as well. The process of integration can thus go into several layers and at each level or all or only some of the inputs may be taken up for integration. An example of integration and deintegration in the manufacture of an active pharmaceutical ingredient called cephalexin is illustrated on the side. Cephalexin is an antibiotic product which is orally administered. It requires 780CA as well as other intermediates to be manufactured into cephalexin. But 780CA itself requires 6APA which again requires penicillin G. It is therefore open to the manufacture of cephalexin to manufacture 780C, the intermediates or 6APA or the downstream penicillin G. This illustrates that the entire material value chain as well as the product value chain are interlinked in terms of the integration possibilities. A study of the bill of materials of any product will also throw adequate light on the possibilities for vertical integration. Vertical integration is a strategic evolution of the traditional make or buy decisions that used to be taken by procurement departments. The extent to which a firm would like to integrate is inversely correlated to the extent to which a firm would like to outsource. So integration and outsourcing are two extremes. You can be 100% integrated, you can be 100% outsourced, except to the extent of doing very minimal uh, transactions such as labeling and packing. Even those can be outsourced if you wish. When you integrate, the product is influenced by high fixed costs, elimination of supplier margins and risks of high asset base in downturns. So in this, the risk factors are the fixed costs and the redundant asset base that could emerge when the economic recession hits the company. On the other hand, the positive side is in terms of the elimination of supplier margins. Typically, supplier margins range between 10 to 20 percent depending on the type of component. So, a company by integrating would save 10 to 20 percent of the procurement costs, which would be a sizable amount. But at the same time, if the costs of setting up those integration facilities are having a capital cost more than that, that would be a offsetting factor. When you look at outsourcing, the product is influenced by the low fixed costs because you are going to be asset light, but you would be having the supplier margins built into component pricing and therefore into the final product pricing. So that adds 10 to 20% to the end product cost as we have seen from the integration discussion. Also, there could be risks of supplier defaults. It is quite possible that when you have hundreds of suppliers, some of those suppliers are weak in terms of financial structure and they could default or fail when economic downturn happens. So what are the options in terms of integration and outsourcing beyond what we have discussed. There are two other options. One is taper integrate, another is quasi integrate. We will discuss that when we come to those topics. And also the integration itself can be looked at in terms of downstream or backward integration and upstream or forward integration. 
the discussions we had on paper integration and quasi integration briefly earlier and with which we will have in this lecture will give you a peek of the advantages we could have through those processes but also the disadvantages that could occur what are the strategic benefits of integration like all strategic decisions integration has important generic strategic benefits and costs integration has benefits when the volume throughput is high leading to efficient scale it is also beneficial when demand has steady growth small volumes are not conducive to integration because the fixed costs of setting up integrating facilities would always be higher than the margins that would accrue from integration the strategic benefits of integration are 16 as listed here one it will provide economies of combined operations same number of leadership positions could oversee a much larger value chain that is a big advantage for example economies of internal control and coordination occur instead of discussing with the material supplier about the specifications it is much better done internally through departmental coordination mechanisms economies of information when a component vendor supplies you a component there is going to be some level of opacity on the factors governing the production as well as the production cost but as part of one company there would be economies of information that is available transparently across the company and economies of captive market when you have your own vendor you don't negotiate anything similarly when the component is supplied in house the component maker that is the division of your company doesn't negotiate much so there are economies related to that similarly when you are a captive supplier you don't have to spend on sales and marketing for reaching or accessing the market therefore there are economies of avoiding the market there are economies related to stable relationships so as many as six economies could be identified by us as part of the integration advantages some vertical integration economies have certain characteristics which are very unique if you are a steel company if you integrate into coal mines there would be substantial advantages not necessarily related only to the margins it is also related to the continuous supply because continuous supply is key to the success of steel plants you cannot shut down a blast furnace because coal is not available but on the other hand if you have coal mines under your control you will be able to see how the steel production and the coal production can be mutually aligned that is a great advantage of vertical integration which we can call vertical integration specific economies technical collaboration is easily done in pharmaceutical industry we have what we call paragraph first to file opportunities wherein a new salt form a new compound or a new generic formulation can be developed out of the patented products and the patent holder could be challenged but that requires tremendous amount of coordination technological alignment between the supplier of the api and the maker of the formulation where these two are separate entities there is going to be some negotiation there is some going to be arbitrage and also there is going to be some time delay whereas if api and formulations reside in one ownership entity there would be much smoother and much more powerful technological collaboration assured supply and our demand is another advantage and it will have offset bargaining power it will smooth the input cost distortions and there would be enhanced ability to differentiate there was a company which had its foundry as an outside unit but when it was amalgamated with the company which was taking the foundry castings then the economics of the foundry unit improved so this is the enhanced ability to smooth an input cost distortions and have an ability to differentiate itself there will be elevated entry barriers it is much easier to enter into an industry which is having asset light companies but it's much more difficult to enter into an industry which has asset heavy companies and are also drawing certain advantages out of the asset heavy approach there would be elevated mobility barriers because of integration and one could enter a higher return business because of integration that is if you have the ability to manufacture press tools dies and sheet metal parts as an example 
a company which is specializing in commercial vehicles may be able to enter more easily into the passenger car manufacturer and vice versa and you can defend against foreclosure attempts integration the level of value chain control could act as a negative factor for banks or other institutions demanding rationalization or foreclosure not every case of integration will benefit from these advantages that i have listed the success of integration economics very much depends on the demand situation on the nature of the industry and the level of integration in growth markets integration will certainly sustain and will prove itself through the better uh, margins that would accrue but in recessionary markets it is a burden that has to be carried until the market improves there are strategic costs of vertical integration those are costs as well as risks although it is a movement across a defined value chain of the product it also represents a strategic movement into another business each of those value chain segments would represent a different business than the end product business for example machining of engine items is not the same as casting or forging of the basic components that constitute the engine items they represent two different technologies and two different businesses companies individually could be built on each of these components and even the materials thereof therefore to imagine that vertical integration is easy is fallacious the strategic costs of vertical integration are therefore many the first is the cost of overcoming mobility barriers that is if you want to move from your end product assembly to manufacture of components there are strong mobility barriers related to technology related to time related to effort related to managerial bandwidth all these need to be overcome to be able to move into that and the debt levels will increase operating lever will therefore increase increased capital deployed balance sheet size will increase maybe with or without commensurate benefits reduced flexibility to accept better market sources reduced flexibility to change partners if you integrate into component manufacture you are tied with the component manufacturing division while it may be stated in theory that i will have it as a arms length transaction and every time i buy a component i will evaluate outside sources it is easier said than done and that process itself may rob the company of certain benefits of vertical integration once you integrate it is not easy to exit an industry overall exit barriers would increase there would also be the need for higher capital investment tata motors has higher capital investment as a commercial vehicle manufacturer in that division compared to ashok lane because it is far more vertically integrated foreclosure of better vendor or channel opportunities could be another strategic cost when you have captive supply you tend to be smug you can say that any time i can uh, switch on the tap and i will get the supplies and it may not be true either when you have a value chain you have to balance it that is you have to balance the production you have to balance the schedules you have to balance the cost an entire total value chain management has to be done in a very balanced way there are reduced incentives for top class performance as long as competition exists we have seen there will be better performance similarly within the value chain as long competition exists there will be better performance when everything is under one legal entity with common incentives and common salary structures and common benefits the incentives for top class performance are reduced there are also different technological and managerial practices which need to be assimilated to do a formulation requires a different kind of quality mindset as well as operational mindset but to do active pharmaceutical ingredients it is of a different nature cash trap because integration requires deployment of resources those resources would have been spent on more attractive areas and you are committing them in advance to your own end product therefore there is a cash trap in terms of the opportunities that can be undertaken outside the value chain and when you have vertical integration you are biased in favor of your own dealerships that is internal dealerships you are biased in favor of your own supply divisions and the challenge again is that it is not just setting up once and then hoping to manage the fixed cost every time the end product undergoes an improvement or every time couple of components undergo improvements 
every part of the value chain has to be upgraded so the responsibility of upgradation technological modernization continues during the lifetime of the company and the product and there will be additional regulatory constraints and compliances in the pharmaceutical industry example again it manufacture of pharmaceuticals is not considered an environmentally dangerous activity whereas manufacture of bulk drugs which requires chemical synthesis lot of pollution and also solvents and in some cases risky reactions like hydrogenation would entail higher level of environmental compliance pollution control therefore the different regulatory constraints and compliances which get applied on the overall company looking at these 16 costs the perspective will be clear while integration offers multiple strategic and operational benefits it also carries equal number of disadvantages and risks this is one reason why many companies nowadays deintegrate and adopt asset light models focusing more on their core and what is deintegrated emerges as the core of some other company and that company will be able to bring efficiency and effectiveness to that particular product there are some special strategic issues in integration vertical integration is in the nature of forward integration when channels are integrated that is a manufacturer takes on integration of dealerships that is the points of sale then the challenge is one of forward integration it becomes backward integration when vendors or supply sources are integrated each has a set of specific strategic issues what are the special strategic issues in forward integration the ability to master product delivery till customer fulfillment you not only produce a product but you understand how the product is getting received by the customer you are able to understand customer aspirations in face to face interactions because is your responsibility and accountability to sell those products through your own system it will also give improved ability to differentiate the product in the marketplace when a customer sees that the company is putting efforts to ensure that the delivery and marketing is taking place in a good manner brand equity improves that's why many companies such as apple and samsung have their own own retail stores access to distribution channels improves when you have forward integration there will be better access to market information because you are present in the marketplace and you real time deal with the customers and their feedback there is going to be higher level of customer experience which is integrated as part of the firm customer interaction and because you are interacting all the time you are accountable to the consumer much more the consumer can walk into your facility at any time and say that whatever has been promised has not been delivered but if it is done through a third party dealer probably that information will get buffered may not be processed properly or may not be communicated to the firm therefore there is a black box of what happens in terms of the customer feedback in respect of backward integration there are equally special strategic issues how do we really master this end to end product development and manufacture because every component every material is a technology and science in itself and mastering that is multiplying the technological challenge many fold and there are some advantages of differentiating the product in the marketplace you can claim in the marketplace that every component that goes into the product is manufactured within my system therefore it bears my quality stamp that is an advantage development of captive proprietary knowledge you can claim that that is i have knowledge of how a casting is evaluated therefore it spins off as a better machined component as we discussed earlier faster development vis-a-vis -vis competitors ability to optimize overall costs and better accountability to the consumer these are the special strategic issues that exist in the backward integration the advantages of forward integration or in terms of little simplicity and benefit in terms of meeting the customers straight you may probably need to integrate into 30 or 40 dealerships to get the benefit of forward integration but if you really want to get the benefits of backward integration you are not only entering into a new component area you need to do that for hundreds of components and also develop hundreds of 
technologies. So backward integration is always far more challenging than forward integration. The economics of integration can be offset to a considerable degree by long-term contracts and strategic alliances. Why should you invest money and set up your own facility when you can get the same benefit by having a strong contract which is aligned with each other's uh, goals and objectives? For a successful company progress, the right balance between integration and outsourcing is a key aspect. You can't be completely asset light with zero facilities, nor can you be completely asset heavy with 100% of the components being done within in-house facilities. As I briefly mentioned, there are other forms of integration. One is a tapered integration, the other is quasi-integration. Tapered integration is nothing but partial integration with freedom to access the same input or service from the open market. It provides many benefits of integration without its disadvantages. It enables the firm to pursue future integration strategies without the burden of legacy. It enables the firm to accomplish cross-pollination of ideas. It requires the third parties to share the volumes and benefits and also requires the firm to balance the multiple mindsets of in-house and outsource management. Some of them are advantages, some are disadvantages. The way tapered integration works is through some kind of non-exclusive arrangement or semi-exclusive arrangement. You would say that you will be the preferred vendor and I will take 30% of my output from you, but I have the freedom to take 70% from somebody else. This is a methodology to get win-win from the integration as well as outsourcing option. The other is to take equity investments, ownership in the companies that are supplying you the components. It is cemented by ownership or financial interest between the firm and the partner. This equity investment provides some respect for the end product manufacturer in the company that has received investment and the integration can be stronger because of that. It need not always be equity investment. Significant working capital support may be provided by the company which is buying the components. There could be exclusive arrangements for supporting R&D of a new component. These also provide bonding between the component supplier and the end product manufacturer and it promotes a kind of uh, enlightened relationship between the two companies. Quasi-integration achieves many of the benefits of integration without the issues of conflict present in tapered integration and without the burden of having 100% investment made through own resources. However, depending upon whether this equity participation is minor or major, there could be the spectrum of advantages vary. If it is just minor of say 5% or 10%, the component maker may not really respect the end product manufacturer when the component maker is pursuing its own self-interest. On the other hand, if it is major, 70% or 80%, quite possibly you are spending all that money in equity investment and not getting the advantage of having control fully because all said and done, even with 75% investment, a separate company is a separate company. Some of the opacity and diseconomics which we discussed earlier may not be avoided. Most alliances and equity arrangements fail to anticipate the future course of events. Many times quasi-integration arrangements are good for the day, but we don't know how things will move, particularly when disruptive technologies come, then there will be a problem. And leadership tussles between the firm and the associates are a distinct possibility. A capital scarce firm may pursue total outsourcing, while a capital surplus firm may pursue total integration. A firm that titrates its capital deployment with reference to some very specific advantages, be it of the quality or be it of the technological development advantage, would benefit. And where those benefits are not very material, you can pursue tapered integration or quasi-integration as well. Integration gives many illusions. That's why companies have pursued integration as a strategy. And if the firm is able to avoid those illusions, then the integration decision will be clearer and without blinkers. One of the big illusions is that my strong position in the current product can be automatically extended to another. I have done a complex product. Can't I do the other product? 
take an example an efficient manufacturer of automobiles may not be an efficient dealer of automobiles similarly an efficient manufacturer of a group of components cannot be an efficient manufacturer of design and manufacture of the end product which uses those components the second illusion is to think that it is always cheaper and more efficient to do things internally the rise of specialist firms has brought the advantages of a satellite approach to the whole it is not necessary that you need to do everything to be able to be a master of all that you survey there are people who have got much better capabilities to do their components so that illusion also must be cleared because of integration competitors cannot access such capabilities it is a myopic approach because firms can still develop other suppliers and they can be more nimble we cannot also assume that vertical integration can avoid sickness and even save strategically sick businesses on the other hand integration may hasten sickness in times of prolonged recession if a company is able to avoid these illusions of integration the decision making with respect to integration will be much more clear and much more beneficial we cannot therefore take it for granted that the benefits of either backward or forward integration will be substantial and will automatically accrue in every case it has to be thought through case by case basis and also with reference to the technologies and science factors that are involved in the integration decision having considered uh, integration we must consider outsourcing as well there are clear advantages of specialized outsourcing companies today nobody does all the components within oneself it offers technological depth because technology is specialized by the component maker there would be economics of volume integration a company which is manufacturing components for automobile manufacturer could have global market and global supply position so there is a benefit of reduced fixed cost being allocated on the component and therefore better economics so supplying to others is not a competitive move it is actually a very helpful move cost economics of lower overheads of the overall cost getting spread competitiveness because you are developing a component to varied levels of capable manufacturers the ultimate manufacturer tends to have higher level of competitiveness which is on the higher side and collaborative alliance are also an advantage the factors that drive outsourcing are diffused capital investments you don't have to put blocks of money in the same value chain there is technological sophistication not because of the end product company itself but because of the component makers who have achieved such technological sophistication an entrepreneurial culture you are dealing with uh, companies which are specializing in certain components and want to specialize in the growth of those components and national policies particularly when micro small medium enterprises are encouraged in a nation such as india and when entrepreneurial and startup formats are encouraged then outsourcing becomes a viable option which is in alignment with national policies outsourcing has come to stay as a reality it is a structural reality of any industry and it has strategic benefits the success of apple itself illustrates that outsourcing and differentiation can coexist and when managed well can propel the firm to a leadership position the second decision very important decision is capacity expansion decision you are serving a market based on certain demand forecast unless you expand your capacity you cannot meet the market requirements and therefore you cannot have market share but everybody will be trying to get this market demand and therefore everybody would be trying to expand the capacity there could be therefore excess capacity in the industry during some periods and there could be shortfall in capacity in certain times when and how to expand capacity and on what product lines to expand capacity are the critical decision in a firm's journey capacity is the primary enabler for a firm to seek and not necessarily achieve market share just because you have capacity it doesn't mean that market share automatically accrues to the company firms that do not expand capacity in time lose the ground to the more aggressive competition that's why companies which invest in capacity expansion in recessionary times 
tend to benefit when the market booms. Firms that overbuild capacity without the ability to sustain become vulnerable. However, that is the contra to what I have mentioned earlier. The challenge is that while by and large demand may move up in incremental steps, capacity can move up only in fixed blocks which are much larger than the incremental steps. That is, you can have demand for a product going up in 10,000 units every year. But the capacity itself can be established with one block of 50,000 units. Therefore, this capacity decision will always have a higher uh, potential for surplus. What is the capacity planning algorithm? First, you identify the required capacity based on revenue and market share goals. Assess future demand profile, costs and prices and develop a growth strategy. Predict capacity additions by customers because you are not the only player and if you know that everybody is trying to have a capacity level equal to the demand, you can conceive of a situation where there is huge excess capacity in the industry, in which case you may have to taper down your capacity expansion plan. We have also seen that some of those uh, inputs or uh, red herrings done by competitors. You should have the judgmental capability to separate red herrings from the actual indicators. Once you do all this analysis, you have to establish the overall industry structure and demand and the firm's position. You should finally test and approve the strategic and business model. The capacity planning algorithm again is not cast the stone and is not a one-time activity. It is a repetitive iterative algorithm that needs both quantitative and qualitative analysis. It requires uh, data-based analytics. It also requires insight, intuition and wisdom-based judgmental analysis. The capacity planning paradox is confronted by every good firm and overcome. However, if a firm doesn't attach much importance to capacity planning, there are ever-present risks of losing out on market share in case of low capacity addition and losing out financial viability in the case of excessive capacity addition. Those companies which manage their capacity planning decisions with wisdom are likely to be the successful companies. Demand can be cyclical in nature. It can be optimistic or pessimistic based on projections. So getting one demand forecast is very difficult. Second, Products are not necessarily unique. Competition may come in with substitution products. And capacity, as we see, keeps on moving up as the minimum block because technology itself is getting modernized and you need large modern plants to deliver the kind of capacity you need. And companies tend to be proactive in capacity preemption. So the conventional wisdom is that you should add capacity in growth cycle. The contrarian wisdom is that you should add capacity in the down cycle. Many times contrarian wisdom succeeds. To be able to succeed with contrarian wisdom, companies need conviction with their strategies and resources to be able to sustain in recessionary period. If your product is technologically weak or if you see the competition coming up with superior products, it is not appropriate to invest in a contrarian manner on your likely obsolete products at all. On the other hand, if your product has got technological edge, which will be future proof, then you must invest in the capacity built for those kinds of products. So it is linked to the capability competency you have in terms of R&D. Any manufacturing investment is driven by the superiority or otherwise of the R&D of the company. That is important consideration. Another aspect of capacity paradox is that you should have the ability to bring down the break-even point. Because capacity is added in fixed blocks, a company which can break even at 70% of the capacity is superior to a company which requires 100% capacity utilization to break even. So the trend is towards planned capacity in high blocks which are technologically ordained but bring down the break-even point to as low as possible levels. That is the secret of success in capacity expansion. Although this is a foundational decision which needs to be taken with much care and analysis, it also is one of the decisions which contributes to a lot of uh, issues in the 
company's financial stability when and how to expand capacity and on what product lines to expand capacity are critical decisions in a firm's journey and these tend to be taken many times emotionally as well there are several classes of uh, factors that are causing this kind of capacity overbuild technological causes structural causes governmental causes competitive causes information flow causes and managerial causes as many as six different types of causes are there for firms overbuilding their capacity i will only mention some of the causes it is impossible in the time available to cover each and every item with examples the first is the capacity addition taking place in large lumps that is the technology of capacity addition economies of scale drive your decisions because when you do the analysis and when you find that at 100% of capacity your cost structure is uh, halved then there is a higher temptation and you overbuild the capacity because the more you are able to produce the more you learn as to how you can do a product with greater efficiency and effectiveness the other is that if you don't add capacity now to add capacity again is a great issue so people try to add as much capacity as possible in one go rather than keep revisiting the decision and the minimum efficient scale that is available is no longer uh, what it was in the previous uh, generations of facilities but much higher so changes in production technology are also causes if you look at the fill finish equipment that is equipment which uh, fill active bulk drugs into a sterile injectable vial 20 years ago the maximum speeds were probably 100 vials per minute but today the maximum speeds have gone up to 600 vials per minute and the minimum speed itself is 100 vials per minute so the minimum efficient scale has gone up because of the technological improvements in terms of structural factors we have exit barriers there is kind of forcing of our going into capacity build up because suppliers are not playing uh, ball with us they are playing truant and credibility is built because of the structural position of the capacity when we say that we are the company with the largest capacity in the industry market respects us therefore credibility is higher integrated competitors prompt us to have higher capacity and logically of course capacity share is indicative of the potential demand share you have all capacity is not translated into demand for your product or your company but without capacity you cannot hope to have demand so capacity is therefore a necessary condition but not a sufficient condition for you to have higher market share age and type of capacity affects demand from the governmental aspect to generate employment governments give various incentives for higher capacity governments are willing to give you acres and acres of land provided you build capacity of that scale you are therefore prompted to get into capacity decisions governments support indigenous industry or even multinational companies coming and putting up big indigenous plant the entire production link incentive scheme and the new semiconductor policy or tune towards getting high capacity within these sectors pressures to increase or maintain employment competition within state governments entrepreneurs hedging risk and global competition are governmental related factors and capacity gets built when we have large number of capable firms each of the firms jostling for capacity and market share when there is no single market leader therefore people are not able to look at one company taking decisions when five equal players are is more difficult than taking a decision when there is one leader and four followers new entry adds to the capacity first mover advantages prompts you to put bigger level of capacity there are conflicting signals emanating from the marketplace that also leads to capacity addition and high liquidity companies are flush with funds let's say then capacity addition is one of the easiest decisions that are taken by the firms because you do what you already know and if you have a module of 100000 units it's very easy to replicate it and add another module in my own experience when we had acquired uh, orchids uh, cell injectable facilities we received one line each in three antibiotic areas 
one of the first decisions we have taken was to double the lines in each of these therapeutic areas because we saw that demand was there capability in the company was there to add capacity and commit investments so that is one of the fundamental and simplest decisions to take when liquidity is existing and there is demand information flow on future expectations assumptions market signaling structural changes that are happening or could happen investor pressures analyst pressures these constitute a cluster of information factors that prompt us to take decisions on capacity either way and the managers leaders that exist in an industry and run the course of affairs of the company play a big role some companies like high capacity management that is they believe that if you have high capacity you will be a leader in the industry that is their mindset people who have those mindsets and people who in addition are task oriented production orientation who have asymmetric aversion to risk or asymmetric carelessness towards risk they are likely to take decisions favoring capacity addition the aggression of leadership scale orientation support capacity expansion whereas play safe approach reduces the intention to add capacity as i said different companies including the managerial and leadership people have different reasons as about to overbuild capacity firms need to be introspective there are limits to capacity expansion financial constraints are the most notable limits that are faced in the expansion decisions the other important guidance is in terms of the opportunities available elsewhere when you have 1000 crores there is no point in putting all the 1000 crores in the same business you might allocate half of it for this business but other half could be for businesses that would have either higher uh, benefit in terms of business or uh, higher reputational uh, strength we have discussed already the multi horizon strategy a rational allocation which could be 50% on the existing business 30% on the emerging business and 20% on the futuristic business could be one way another company depending upon risk profile and also the nature of the core industry could look at 20% 30% and 50% it varies so the limits to capacity expansion are financial limits other opportunities that could be foregone if you don't uh, invest in other sectors and uncertain demand within the core industry the preemptive strategies when there is uncertainty try to close the uncertainty by being certain you build capacity ahead of others and industry is done with it you reap huge economies in the first go again industry is done with it and signal and execute ahead of others so that there is no additional capacity so these are the aspects that need to be considered in capacity decision a company has to be very careful about capacity expansion in periods of industrial transformation in the automobile industry because of the tempering of demand that has happened over the last 3 years there could be a boom for vehicles in 2022 and 2023 the capacities could be easily touched and challenged in terms of meeting the demand so how do you take capacity expansion decisions in such a case when we also know that electric vehicles need to be manufactured and that requires a completely different set of investments at times capacity contraction rather than capacity expansion will serve a firm under certain conditions companies may have to think that it is my responsibility to guide the industry as well as the market there is no point in trying to cater to what market wants based on its past information you may have to guide the market saying that the new generation of products are the ones which you should really favor and start reducing the capacity in established products which will go out of uh, reckoning after a few years so that is an enlightened and also bold leadership strategy that could be pursued capacity decisions should not aim just at only market dominance they should be conscious of sustainable businesses particularly when you look at by drugs and others there's no point in keeping on expanding capacity in one location knowing the kinds of pollution pressures that could be generated in one location therefore you should spread your location decisions and capacity decisions 
You should also look at the type of capacity which would be as important as or even more important than capacity levels in such cases. Type of capacity is more important than level of capacity. That is, if you are able to generate investments into flexible capacity which can produce not only the current product line but several other product lines, your capacity decisions would be much more helpful for the future course. In periods of industrial transformation, I repeat, the aggregate of old type and new type of capacity would be far greater than the capacity profiles the industry and the firms are accustomed to. And there is a challenge inherent in this. And the balance must keep moving towards the new type of capacity that will be required and is in the interest of both the market as well as the firm. Third aspect we need to consider is the diversification or entry into new businesses. Without doubt, diversification is an exciting subject. Leaders and managers would like to diversify. But the strategic decision to diversify or enter into a new business is a very important decision for a firm. It cannot be done casually and it also cannot be done in a herd approach manner. It is as important as a decision to set up a new business for the first time. The reasons for diversification are both internal and external. The current industry gets saturated, then you must move out. Not by phasing out, but getting into a new business. There are limits to growth in the current industry, so you have to seek growth in another industry. There are fewer options to reinvent in the current industry, you have to go into other industries. The firm has surplus funds to invest and therefore you must seek additional opportunities. These are all logical, strategic and business oriented reasons. The external reasons are that many other industries offer opportunities for entry. If you are a company specializing in uh, basic food ingredients, ready to cook, ready to eat, packaged foods may offer better opportunities. If you are a company specializing in non-organic products, development of organic products may offer better uh, reasons for entry. Other industries offer greater growth potential. The profit level may not be high, but the growth potential could be high. So you have to analyze all external industrial opportunities, both in terms of the growth potential as well as the profit potential. If your R&D has developed a specialized process, probably you could become a leader in that industry. We have seen two examples earlier where Although the digital photography was developed, Kodak chose not to enter the industry and lost out. Similarly, we had seen where Xerox developed new PC related innovations but then chose not to enter that industry and lost out those opportunities. In fact, R&D laboratories typically have the ability to develop new technologies and new products beyond what they are doing. One must really be entrepreneurial and catch those opportunities and get into other businesses. By and large, carefully selected and granulated diversification opportunities provide better returns. Even when the current industry offers growth potential, some firms may as a policy diversify to hedge economic and business cycles. In this process, Sunrise Technologies and industries offer a particularly great opportunity for making diversification moves. Companies such as Startup Technologies are the entities that were set up when nobody was thinking about the sunrise technologies and that is now proving to be very beneficial. Certain integration decisions take the hue of diversification when the products scatter to multiple industries. Sensors for example, you may enter uh, a sensors uh, business but you should be aware that it could prime your growth in different directions because in future sensors are the core of everything that is either static or dynamic be it the refrigerator or the automobile. So that is the kind of potential of getting into a new business of that type. Many times governmental policies and regulatory pressures induce or stimulate diversification. The diversification decision is having significant impact in terms of the risk reward relationship and also future growth profit relationship. And diversification can be implemented through completely greenfield projects or through acquired projects. That is, they can be greenfield projects or brownfield projects. Diversification leads to a portfolio of businesses or a conglomeration of companies as well. There are two types of diversification. 
and these types are based on the products and services that are offered and the key test is related versus unrelated. Business history tells us that both types of diversification have had their respective shares of success as well as failure. Let's take two examples of related diversification. A passenger car manufacturer moving into commercial vehicles or vice versa is a related diversification because both the lines are within the broader automobile industry. A thermal power producer moving into hydrogen power is also a related diversification. An unrelated diversification is an example of a manufacturer of soaps moving into consumer electronics. It could be successful, it may not be successful. It was successful in the case of Wipro. A capital goods producer moving into pharmaceuticals again is a challenge. So it could be successful, may not be successful. Fujifilm is a Japanese company that specialized in uh, films and other photographic equipment. But it had a co-competence in chemicals and chemistry. It chose to move into pharmaceuticals and at the first look, how can a photography company move into pharmaceuticals? It looks like a completely unrelated diversification, but the company has been able to find a common thread and make this unrelated diversification work. So it is also not to be only superficial analysis based on the end product. We need to look at the entire value chain of the product to understand what could be the related diversification and what could be the unrelated diversification. Related diversification, as I said, easily judged on the aspects of similarity of products and markets, some common capabilities, a factor which I emphasize now, and potential for synergy across the world and new. These should drive related diversification. Unrelated diversification, completely dissimilar products or markets, completely new capabilities, and potential for spreading risks and rewards. So, if you are in construction industry, Getting into real estate could be a related diversification, which last and tube are completed successfully. However, if you are in construction industry, getting into automobile manufacture is an unrelated diversification. So, the decisions have to be taken based on the circumstances, the product capabilities, company capabilities, opportunities. Diversification needs to be considered in a much broader canvas in terms of economic sectors, products and services that have different economic and business factors. Adani Group as an example decided that it would be definitely work on economy facing infrastructure diversification projects period. It does not look at uh, manufacture of computers, it does not look at uh, manufacture of automobiles, it looks at economy facing infrastructure areas be it shipbuilding, port operations, be it power plants, be it airport acquisition and management, be it new oil, new energy. These are the kinds of things which the company is looking at and or has looked at already. Products and services can be considered in terms of sectoral orientation. I gave you one hint already. Let us look at what exists as a totality. The different types of sectors you can look at to judge your uh, diversification domains are the following economy facing sectors. These are steel, cement, infrastructure, construction, banking, financial services and insurance, commercial vehicles, capital goods and energy. The second cluster is consumer facing sectors, electronics, white goods, FMCG, hotels, travels, entertainment, cars and two wheelers, pharmaceuticals. You cater to a wide spectrum of people on a daily basis. It is not that you set up an infrastructure project and you are done with it. You got to manage this product renewal on a continuous basis. You need to maintain the customer engagement and customer experience on a regular basis. So these are consumer facing sectors. There are sectors which are driven by technology, information technology, IT enabled services, digital products and services including AR, VR and artificial intelligence. There are sectors which are environment facing, electric vehicles, green chemistry, clean technologies, renewables fall under this category. And socially oriented sectors, education, healthcare, drinking water, sanitation, affordable housing, redevelopment. Each of these is a diversification opportunity when a company looks at outside the sector in which it is currently present. 
and when a company moves across within the sector generally it tends to be a related diversification in some manner or the other but if a company chooses to hop across the sector then it becomes an unrelated diversification at a broad level diversification across the sectors would be the unrelated diversification while diversification within the sectors could be seen as related diversification but there are various levels of relatedness steel and cement could be related diversification based on this example but technologies are completely different but cement and infrastructure could be related infrastructure and construction could be related capital goods and energy could be related to some extent non banking finance and commercial vehicles could be related but commercial vehicles and construction may not be related therefore we need to look at each subsector of an economy to judge whether these are related or not related the considerations in diversification are many it is not just the revenue and growth potential but the risk as well as reward profile there are sources of entry barriers into an industry and these relate to the structure of the industry you are contemplating and the retaliation from the incumbents the investments required the startup losses that is the pre operative losses that you need to bear are clear entry barriers based on the structure of the industry you cannot set up a steel plant with 100 crores you may need upwards of 1000 crores to be able to set up you cannot set up a pharmaceutical plant with 10 crores you need upwards of 100 crores to set up a pharmaceutical plant so these are the requirements to enter an industry and when you enter an industry incumbents are not going to keep quiet they are going to come up with enhanced products and reduced prices the marketing costs would escalate therefore the entry barriers have to be considered when a diversification decision is being taken and the diversification decision has to be understood through financial filters cash inflows and cash outflows have to be carefully forecast and measured revenues and profits equity and debt support in terms of cash inflow cash outflows in terms of costs of investments and costs of overcoming entry and retaliation and another one which may not be considered is the dividend decision that would be taken when you run the new business what are the shareholder expectations and that is linked to the type of financial instrument you have used capital budgeting techniques including discounted cash flow and irr techniques help establish whether the returns are more than the cost of capital for the firm how do we navigate diversification diversification can be navigated by controlling the entry costs and also by properly responding to the incumbent related retaliation we have to remember that any diversification decision will be met with by retaliation but if you have different types of entries you may have different types of retaliation retaliation will be higher if you are entering an industry which is having these characteristics that is slow growth commodity or commodity like products high fixed costs high industry concentration incumbents are highly committed to the products and positions incumbent managements are highly committed to their position if you want to enter an fmcg industry today then hindustan unilever colgate palmolive are likely to come up with significant counter measures to thwart your entry on the other hand if you want to enter infrastructure industry you yourself have to think that this industry is of slow growth should i be doing this beyond a particular level if you are identifying a target industry for internal entry you have to be clear as to what are your philosophies and what are your rationale for getting into the industry one of the logical factors could be to enter industries with sunrise technologies you also enter industries where the entry barriers are low but will raise in future that is you are in a position to enter the industry but after your entry you are able to increase the entry barriers so that others cannot come in this is a very beneficial type of uh, diversification that is timeliness of diversification through external entry enter industries with dated technologies and practices an industry which is crying for attention in terms of technological upgradation that is the industry where you should make your move enter if incumbents do not have deep pockets 
they are not able to retaliate effectively then also you should enter that industry if you have the confidence not only technologically but also managerially to shape or influence the new industry structure you must enter and you must also enter when the new industry has positive spin off effect on existing businesses there is no reason why an information technology giant cannot enter into an industry which is comprised of artificial intelligence it has the ability similarly companies which are in imaging such as canon and toshiba can enter the ar vr industry because they have the capabilities and they can have positive spin off from those developments and also they have the ability to shape the industry because of their core competencies diversification for us will be successful when the right industries are chosen and the entry is made with more competitive and more capable products and technologies and the pricing also should be attractive vis-a-vis -vis the incumbents products and prices this is a big charter and not all factors of the charter will be possible and that's where the challenge of management also lies leveraging the charter points where you are very strong and overcoming the weaknesses that are related to the charter points that are not so strong one of the ways in which you diversify is through acquisition or even merger it is a very potent route it drastically cuts the time required to just a few months in comparison to a few years it takes actually very long time to build facilities develop talent create the network and acquire competitiveness organically acquisitions therefore are the best route to do things fast particularly when you have this investable money but it also has got its flow and issues the acquisition algorithm is fairly simple but uh, business with lot of uh, challenges you have to identify the target industry then you have to identify the target company usually companies which are available for acquisition do not have the best of financials or there could be several legacy issues which are not disclosed analyze the current and future business prospects of the target company develop a financial model of acquisition conduct due diligence and validate refine the models and finally raise finances internally or externally to make the acquisition the acquisitions many times have several issues generally as with any real estate project which you encounter in our life we feel that we are overpaying for the acquisition and there would be unexpected changes in the environment one of the classic cases uh, probably i have already talked about or would talk about is the dr reddy's acquisition of beta form which was a german generics company when it acquired it was having significant generic blueprint and good margins but within months of the acquisition the generic marketing environment changed and the regulations changed allowing uh, pan european bidding which made the close german market move from a profit position to a negligible profit position that dealt an unexpected blow to dr reddy so unexpected changes in an environment could take place there could be inadequate and ineffective agreements acquisition can only go through based on the agreements between two parties and if they do not foresee the kind of issues that would happen then there would be problems in acquisitions cultural and leadership differences integration of the acquired company with the acquiring company is a critical factor and if there are different cultures involved and we do not know which leader will rule which entity there could be significant problems in acquisition many times acquiring companies ignore the acquired company strengths acquisitions are done because the companies are strong but once acquired those are relegated because there is a dominance related to the acquiring company's financial strength or leadership strength cost and price structures could go awry because of lack of proper due diligence diversification through acquisition or merger will be successful when appropriate due diligence is conducted prior to the acquisition harmonious integration is accomplished and firms operate to preserve their mutual strengths and derive synergy of their strengths that has to happen for the diversification to be successful so with this we have covered three critical uh, aspects of strategic decision making and strategic execution integration vertical as well as its uh, various uh, concomitants such as backward integration forward integration tapered integration cross integration we looked at the other aspect of integration that is outsourcing 
we looked at capacity expansion and we looked at diversification including mergers and acquisition which is entry into new businesses thank you for your attention